Good morning, everybody, and welcome to PSG of Mercer County. The Professional Service Group of Mercer County is a group that is here for you, anybody that is any, in any sort of career transition or job search. And in addition to good morning, happy Aloha Friday. I'm not sure how much you can see from the podium. I'm wearing my green Hawaiian shirt today. And so for no special reason other than it goes well with my black pants. And so that's why I wore that one. And uh, we do celebrate Aloha Friday. It is casual Friday in Hawaii. That's how they celebrate casual Friday. Here we just kind of have business casual. And there they wear uh, Aloha wear, mumus, and Aloha shirts, etc. And in addition, it is the 147th anniversary today of the telephone. Well, not this thing. This thing's only been around 15 to 20 years, I guess. Uh, but um, 147 years ago today, in 1876, Alexander Graham Bell conducted his first successful experiment with what became the telephone. And his first message was to Thomas Watson, his assistant, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. And then uh, the prompt reply was, um, I'm going to put you on hold. There was no hold button at the time. And so the start of the telephone, its anniversary was today. So a little bit of an auspicious day. Um, there's a little bit of a celebration coming up in Princeton. If you're around on uh, Tuesday, uh, it will be Pie Day. They are not eating pie. It's 3.14, May, uh, March 14th, and there'll be lots of celebrations. The library will have events, lots in town. So if you're able to come to Princeton and see, find an Einstein, I'm sure there'll be a few of them around. It's always fun. It's most of the day. Um, yep, restaurants will have things. You, you check online. So you may want to come to Princeton if you haven't been here in a while and celebrate Pi Day. Uh, for a little bit of fun a few years ago, I was here on Pi Day on uh, 2015. So if those math people, it's um, 3.1415. So I had those digits. Uh, but it's always fun. PSG of Mercer County, we are here to pro provide all manner of information and support for you to help you be more efficient and effective in your own job search. Um, we do have our LinkedIn group, and it is a little bit of a private group in that uh, once you press the join button, you will be put in pending status. And the reason why we put you in pending status is we will check that you have attended at least one of our meetings, either in person or virtually. Uh, in person, we check either on a laptop or sign-in sheet, and virtually we check the attendance at any meeting. And the reason why we do that is we just want to kind of keep out people that are name collectors and list collectors and maybe even potential spammers, people that are just collecting names and information only for their own benefit. So if you happen to sign up this week, you may see it'll take a day or two before we accept you. But once you're in, uh, we have over 1,700 members in our LinkedIn group. They are all people that have been to at least one of these meetings. So there's a good chance that as you conduct your job search, and you want to reach out to people on LinkedIn, if they are a member of our group, there's a good chance they will uh, reply to you because they kind of get the importance of job search and being in communication. So just be aware that there's a real benefit that way. Of course, uh, you can post discussions, you can be active. It's always good to be active in LinkedIn in lots of ways. And discussions uh, on groups are a great way to do that. And uh, or share job leads, or even if you're new to the group, introduce yourself. Maybe kind of type a short version of your introduction or elevator pitch. Hello, my name is David and I'm an IT consultant. You might just put that in. You get some uh, interest from people. In addition, we do have our website. It is psgofmercercounty.org, psgofmercercounty.org. It is more than just a landing page and an introduction of our group. It has over 120 pages of web content. There's a lot of information that's on our website. Um, we do have a menu along the top. One is called Career Options. is a Career Options menu item. As you navigate through those pages, what you'll see is um, a section for getting started, a section to learn if you're interested in beginning to work as a consultant, to shift from full-time employment as an employee, uh, starting a business, and a lot of other information. It's not the be-all and end-all of any of that stuff, but it may be a good starting point if you have any interest in those topics as well. So go take a look at our website, take a look at our career options page and see if there's any helpful information that's there. Uh, also within there, I think there's searching, uh, learning how to use LinkedIn, improve your networking, all sorts of great topics for getting started or restarted in your job search. 
Uh, in today's presentation, Jeff will actually not be sharing a slide presentation. He's going to be doing a presentation where he's talking to us. So what may be the nicest experience would be not to have all the active cameras on. You can have a setting. There's a setting at the top of your computer. Uh, it might say active cameras. There might be other selections there, like everyone or who's talking. You want to change it to who's talking. And when you change it to who's talking, what you'll do is you'll see only the person who's talking, which for the moment is me, uh, but in just, in just a moment. Oh, I missed that. Uh, oh, oh, there it is. Uh, maybe you want to put it on who's not talking. But yeah, put it on who's talking, because uh, you'll get to see Jeff face to face. Uh, well, depending on how big your screen is, it's probably a life-size image. Here, we're going to see a blow-up size of Jeff, because we have a large screen. So it might just make a little bit more pleasant experience. If you have any questions for Jeff, I think if it's okay with Jeff, all you'll need to do is politely unmute your microphone and uh, say, Jeff, I've got a question, and he'll address it at the time. Those of us here, just raise your hand, and I'll be uh, monitoring and proctoring that as well. And so uh, when you do have a question, we will ask you to use the microphone up front for those of you here and talk right up to it. And the reason why is we want to make sure that the sound system and the people online will hear your question. And so we just ask that you do that as well. We moved it a little closer. Hopefully, it's more convenient for you. So that is our uh, introduction. So with that, PSG of Mercer County is pleased to welcome Jeff Altman. People hire Jeff Altman, the big game hunter, for his no BS coaching and career advice globally because he makes everything easier so you don't have to figure things out. That can relate to job search, hiring more effectively, managing and leading better, as well as handling different workplace issues. He hosts JobSearchTV.com, JobSearchTV.com on YouTube and Amazon, as well as the number one podcast on Apple Podcasts for Job Search, No BS Job Search Advice Radio, with almost 2,600 episodes over more than 12 years. His website, TheBigGameHunter.us, TheBigGameHunter.us, has, has an enormous resource blog, as well as information about his courses, books, and guides. You can schedule a free discovery call with him at his site for time, uh, for, uh, you can, I'm sorry, uh, you can schedule time for coaching with him, as well as a trusted advisor session where he answers your question. So you can also connect with Jeff on LinkedIn. You can search for it at The Big Game Hunter. PSG of Mercer County is pleased to welcome back The Big Game Hunter, Jeff Altman. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having me back. I appreciate it. And um, before I start the presentation, I just want to say the jobs report came out today. And the headline number looked great, but you got to go a little bit below that. Uh, it was the number of new jobs the government claims were created was 311,000, which not as good as last month, but is still extremely good until you actually read the report. <laughs> so of these, 264,000 of these are low wage positions in leisure and hospitality, social services and healthcare, and the jobs we pay for primarily in local government. And that's, again, 264,000 of the 311,000. And if you work in technology, negative 25,000. So it's interesting how these numbers are coming out. And uh, I just thought I would start off by sharing that. So. I'm going to be presenting today on being more desirable as a job hunter. And I have to also say these qualities also affect how successful you are professionally. So again, I picked the word desirable, very different than competence. So let me first define the term. Desirable means having pleasing qualities or properties. You're attractive. For example, like in a desirable location or worth having or seeking or doing. It's advisable. So what makes someone desirable? And now we're going to play a fun little game where I'm going to embarrass a couple of you. Uh, 
So I don't care if you're married or in a long-term relationship or what have you. I want you to go back and imagine what you what it was like to be 16 or 18 or 20 or maybe 25 years old. And there was a time you were dating. Even back in the Paleolithic era, <laughs> way back in time, you were back there dating. How did you make yourself desirable to someone? So now is my time to embarrass a few of you. And let's try. Hmm, John Sampson, how did you make yourself desirable to someone? I didn't smell too bad. Yeah, what else? Um, had a job. Um, could afford to take a uh, young lady or uh, not so young uh, out to a half decent place uh, was what they were telling me. Always look forward to your phone call, John, uh, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, Bruce, Bruce Wentworth, how about you? How did you do it? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's going back ways. Um, And I tried to, you know, have the right haircut, have the right uh, clothes, I think it was one way. You looked a certain way. Yeah. Good. I had my, uh, my John Lennon glasses. Gotcha. That's great. Um, Carol McCullough, how about you? What did you do to be attractive to others? I think it's been covered basically um, looked the best I could be. Um, also, behave politely, was interested in the other person. Excellent. So you listened attentively to the other person. Yes. Excellent. And I'm going to pick one more. And it's again, an early alphabet person, Alex Freund. What have you done to be more attractive? What did you do back in the Stone Ages to be more attractive to someone? Alex, I know you're there. Oh, I guess you're not. Okay, so let's move forward and I'll just simply say, these are obvious qualities that people look for. And I'll just start by asking, how did you meet someone to date? And I'm going to ask the ones who answered my question previously to answer this one too. How did you meet someone to even date back in the Stone Ages? Friend introduced me. Gotcha. How else? A worker at school. Uh huh. One more. I know there's a third one of you there. Oh, yeah. Just um, I was going to school. So I met my wife actually through school, but also through social settings like bars and such. I've been married more than once. Um, so as a former headhunter, I, I joke that I learned to interview much better as time progressed. And I met my third wife, and again, that's three, third, in grad school, um, where mm -hmm. she changed classes where she wasn't supposed to, and that's how we met. And we had three first dates. Date number one, first date, didn't call me back. Date number two, first date, didn't call me back. And the third one, third time, and this is over the course of a year and a half, I'd say. And she called back, we went out and it worked. So the notion of how we meet someone is important in this uh, story because it reflects, you know, we all have heard the thing about job hunting is like dating, right? We've all heard this story for years. And the question comes down to how so? And that's really about the notion of desirability. Now, Carol was great. You know, she spoke about trying to be interested in the person that she was talking to, that she was out with. 
and through that learning if she might be more interested in them. And I want to also pose of the three of you, I'm sure there were times that you went out with someone and no chemistry. Why didn't, why did, how did you decide not to go out with them again? Thank you for reaching to the mouse, John. She, she, she didn't call me back. Mm -hmm. Too self-absorbed. Too self-absorbed? Yeah. Excellent. Bruce? Conversation, yeah. did, not, conversation did not flow well. Excellent. Thank you, Gary. Bruce Wentworth. That's, that's about what I was going to say, actually. Awkwardness, just to, you know, it didn't go well conversationally, I guess. Right. How does that sound familiar to job search? <laughs> and the goal here throughout is how do you become more desirable to a person that you're meeting here? And talking about why you're not, you don't go out on a date with them again, whether it's they weren't interested or you weren't interested, kind of reflects where we're going with this conversation. Because fundamentally, I think one of the interesting things that um, we develop a bad habit about is that we've become jaded over the course of time. Business transformation has homogenized and dulled so many of us and turned us into people who are kind of boring. No disrespect, folks. You know, I, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm the oldest person here, but I'm, I'm, I'm certainly up there. And I'll just simply say so much of making yourself desirable has nothing to do with what you do. It has nothing to do with what you um, what you know. It has to do with a lot of secondary things that make a huge difference. So if you've heard me talk before, you know I talk about how firms evaluate people. And competence is only one thing they look for. They like self-confidence, right? Character, chemistry, Maybe a little bit of charisma. Charismatic people always do better than those who are not charismatic. That you care, that they connect with you, and on the professional side, because they want to trust you. Right? No trust, no hire. There's a variation of this on the dating side, too, but I'm not going to go down that road. I'll just simply say, you know, they want to figure out whether they can trust you to do this job. And so much of what I've spoken about has to do with the soft skills, the feeling that you give them that allows them to figure out that you're different. You know, it. Ed Hahn was responding to something that Alex Freund, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Shelley Piedmont had posted a message about um, uh, keywords today. And Ed, Ed Hahn responded back by saying, the thing I think that trips people up most about keywords is that they get you to the first interview. Going further requires the rest, just like in dating. And the one thing you have to remember, like for those of us who did dating for a while, we get cynical over the course of time. Everyone and everything, and I say everything because it could be an ATS system, that reads resumes becomes cynical. They don't believe what they're reading. So you have to do something that transcends, you know, the stuff of does does she or he have this skill? Does she or he have this skill? Because so many people are doing the same kind of stuff that makes it difficult for you to stand out. So I'll just simply say your brand matters. And I also have to say your company's brand matters too. And this is not just simply from the standpoint of where you've worked, uh, 
but the decision you make about where you're going to work can have a positive or negative impact on the future part of your career because if your brand doesn't have an image, it's not an advantage. I remember when I was a beginning recruiter back in the Stone Ages when dinosaurs roamed the earth, and I had a client in the insurance industry who only wanted to see people from branded firms, firms that they recognized. It wasn't that they were in insurance, but they wanted to know about that company and have an association with them. Why? Because in effect, they believed that the previous firm had done a certain amount of screening for them that allowed them to figure out that this person might be okay. And of course, that needed to get confirmed in the course of the interview, because of course, if a person can't demonstrate the skills, you're not going any further, of course. But so much of what got someone in the door and on that first date, like Ed pointed out, was taken care of in advance. So they at least had the opportunity. There was a desire that the firm had to talk to this person because, in effect, in their mind, they were advantaged. And without that brand and association, most of you don't really have a way of looking any different than everyone else whose resumes are coming in that have the same keywords. So your company's brand matters, but it's also your brand too that becomes so important because for them to desire you, for them to be interested in you, you know, is important. That, you know, two of the, uh, the responses about why someone while you were interested in someone, basically involved networking. Ooh, I heard they were terrific. <laughs> you had a recommendation, which translates into, we know our network is important, right? And too few people do enough networking when they're not looking for work. To put themselves out and visible, to stay in, connect, in contact with the people that they know that allows them to be advantaged in people's minds. And I'm not talking about the third party recruiters who say, hi, I heard a lot of nice things about your work. I want to have a chance to talk to you. That's often BS because what they did was they found you on LinkedIn or they got a resume from their system and they're just following up. I'm talking about the real outreach that sometimes goes on where someone has found out something about you. And the result winds up being they're particularly interested in you because they know something about you. Now, how do they find this stuff out? You know, the goal is to make yourself more visible professionally. And I know this takes time and effort that you may not have all the time. And you can make some time for it and it doesn't have to be daily like I do or as other people do. You just have to create a regular calendar for yourself to highlight some of your successes. And in person, you can do it too as you talk to, to people. Now, I want to go into elevator pitches here for a second because, you know, for years I would hate them because they all sounded like right out of the 1980s. Hi. <laughs> you know, they all had that sort of sleazy kind of sound to them. And no one really listened. But if you notice what David read, read of mine, people hire me too. And I want you to think about this for a second for yourself. People hire you to do what? And why do they do it? Because you. One, two sentences, that's all you need to do. And it's so much more effective than the traditional sleazy elevator pitch that we all learned at one point in our lives. If you can come up with a simple sentence about yourself that zeroes in on what your expertise is based upon what other people uh, what you're hired to do, 
and ideally because of what people tell you the reason is they hire you for, you've got a home run there because it's clear, concise, and helps you stand out in the mess that is people awkwardly fumbling around to answer questions. So what do you do? <laughs> Tell me about the work that you do. Well, people hire me because I provide no BS career and coaching advice globally because I make things easier for them professionally. That's a real simple statement. You can have your version of that and it'll be much more effective and it can be on your LinkedIn profile. It's a way of standing out from others. Now, here's one thing in terms of desirability, and I'll speak about myself. And the question is, is the person you married or live with or in a relationship with like the model of the person you thought you'd want to marry or live with? No. <laughs> She got my attention in a variety of different ways. And it opened my eyes up to things I wasn't looking for. And that made a difference. Her personality got through to me. And it got my attention. For most of you, when you are out in the world, when you're in uh, interview situations, networking situations, you're kind of flat. There's nothing that really makes you stand out. How do you distinguish yourself? Now, the first thing is being open to different kinds of situations that you might have considered previously. And that's what happened with Sharon and I. You know, I wasn't her model person either, but it's worked for us 25 years later. And you can do much the same thing as just taking a little bit more time and being a little bit more flexible with what you consider. And for many of you, you have no visibility whatsoever. Who knows about you and how are they going to find you to begin with? What do you do to promote yourself? How would someone find out about you to even know that they should contact you? Now, in the dating situation, a couple of the responses were are about getting a referral. I was introduced to someone. Your network is very important in all of this. And preserving your existing network from previous situations is pivotal. David, it looks like you want to say something. Do you have a question for me there? Um, I could be wrong. No. No, I don't have a question. I'm looking at the room and two monitors. So if I look quizzical. Okay. Right. Thank you. I, I want to be sure about that because in the past, I've seen that look before and I just want to make sure. So the, as the they goal, said in the Top Gun movie, it's the only look I've got. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to practice flexibility, David, because to become desirable for clients, there we go. Personality. I love it. And, and that's really a big part of this. Now, I'm not suggesting you go on interviews and do this to people, but more of you has to be out there. More of you has to be visible on interviews and in professional situations. Uh, a quick anecdote from someone I coached for a number of years. I'm still coaching him. Um, and he was being considered for uh, a senior leadership position with a not-for-profit. And it's a not-for-profit that really values uh, emotional intelligence. And he didn't hear my, my oh. advice to him about how to present to the small board that was going to be evaluating him. So seven people were going to sit in the room and give him okay. 20 minutes okay. and make a decision. And I told him, don't go in and be professional walk in and risk everything. For many of you, the notion of risking it all and risking being rejected is not part of your vocabulary. And John, I know you, you're getting it. <laughs> I'm seeing the smile. I've been seeing the nods. So many people walk in and they're like everyone else. 
How does a company choose you if you're no different than all the others? John, you're on mute, so tell me what you want to say. This business of risk and interviewing uh, uh, is so uh, much the other. I think of some of the comments that people have made in their interview process that really did make a difference. But when I articulate them to whatever group I'm speaking to, everybody sort of sits back and says, oh, my God, I'd never do that. And um, why? Why? Like in dating, taking a risk is important. And the notion of going on an interview and robotically answering questions without your personality being present is a mistake. And I know for many people, it's become harder with time because corporations in the course of our work behave as though they don't want personality. And yet that's the distinguishing quality that makes that will allow you to stand out, whether we're talking about dating and relationships or we're talking about your career, interviewing, getting seen and noticed. You know, Alex Freund will at least weekly post something, tag a couple of people and invite conversations. His stories about buying bread at the farmer's market sticks with me. Why? Because it's not a normal conversation. Where you can get off of the script that you've been, you've had drilled into you for years and be a human being again will make a big difference for you in how people notice you. Now, I'm also going to talk with you about other ways to become visible. And the easiest way to start is by commenting on other people's posts on LinkedIn, adding in, not criticizing. And if you're not, if you want to criticize, your first response should be, Could you tell me more about that (laughs) so that this way you're engaging in conversation that draws the other person out who may not be have written it skillfully or may have misspoken online and thus draw them into the conversation with to which you can follow up had you considered this and offer the criticism in that way (laughs) oh no i didn't really consider that So think of it from the standpoint of how do you become noticed? Because being invisible misses something useful for you. There's a a man I worked with many years ago uh, who's since passed away. And he said, resumes are for when you want to be uh, the hunter because you're the one who's aggressively going out there. LinkedIn is for when you want to be hunted. You want people coming to you. And thus, what do you do to be hunted? Remember, excuse me, LinkedIn sells a product called LinkedIn Recruiter. They sell it to third party recruiters. They sell it to corporations so that people are going out and looking for talent. Things that you post on LinkedIn can be found using Google. Write an article, it can be Googled. Write more, it can be Googled. Communicate more with video. You can upload a short video that talks about yourself and the work that you've done. You can also be interviewed for a podcast. And I'll mention uh, two services to you. And you can look for things that or uh, professionally relate to what you do. You may not see a show that's a perfect fit, but approach them with a topic that makes sense. So the two services are matchmaker.fm and podmatch. I believe it's podmatch.com, but they're not going to be a lot of podmatch 
with different things at the end that are in the podcast space. The goal that you should have is look for opportunities where you can speak to people who are just trying to get an audience. Because on their show, they're trying to find a way to get content. For years, I would uh, once a week interview someone for my show. Often they had a book out. Sometimes, uh, yeah, I was just thinking of uh, uh, someone. Yeah, he had a new book out. He had a, a radio show with a national audience, and his PR people came to me during a time uh, when he had a new uh, a new book out. Putting yourself in front of people allows you to have an audience for what you know and what you've done. And I will tell you that when, th thank you, Sonia, uh, th thinking about how people can find out about you and how you can distinguish yourself from others is a big part of all of this. Because when the search firms, whether it's retained or contingency, are looking for someone, they are looking for someone that's going to make it easy for their client to be interested in you. It's a no brainer from their standpoint. Years ago, a, a dear friend of mine, uh, and, and for those of you who will recognize this term, uh, he worked in operations research as an AVP at a New York bank. The term has long since disappeared. And he was trying to get bigger and get more well-known. And I suggest that go on the speaking circuit, figure out a way that you can get on the stage and present. And he did. And he did that for a while. And suddenly the retained search firm started approaching him. He took a, a position at one bank, eventually with one of the you know, major accounting firms in their consulting practice, made partner there, uh, headed up a region in Canada, all because he got on stage and became visible. Remember, the search firms are looking for people that carry a brand to them. It does. It's not an instantaneous solution, but even for the oldest of us here, we've got time to work this angle. And thus, your goal should be to figure out how to become more visible to people so that they are predisposed to you, so that you don't always have to, shall we say, work so hard to get that date, <laughs> to get asked out. And in doing so, I want to encourage you to practice communicating clearly. And again, going back to dating, you can flirt, play, have fun when you speak. You may be out of practice with it. And if you are, as I suspect many of us are, go to Toastmasters and practice there. There are lots of parts of the presentation that relate beautifully to interviewing and to social situations. It's not just all, uh, always getting up at the lectern and speaking. It can be about their section called Table Topics where you're given an opportunity to give a short extemporaneous speech, one to two minutes in length about a topic that you don't have. You don't know what the topic is going to be until they call on you. And that's the way an interview is, right? It's a short extemporaneous speech. I encourage people to do it in a minute to a minute 15, but it's practice for you to be on the spot and to start using fewer words and more direct communication and you'll discover in your meetings professionally in, with your current firms or in interviews and other situations, your ability to, con to practice connecting with an audience becomes more and more important. How you use your pauses, like if you notice how I'm presenting, there are times where I'm just pausing to allow you to catch up with what I'm saying. I'm not just you know, talking on and on without coming up for air. So again, just to remind you, uh, start writing online. Comments can be a big part of this because it starts to give you visibility. Short articles, they don't have to be the most profound things, but a short article 
and then share it with your connections on LinkedIn. Tag people. Use relevant hashtags. Now, by tagging people, it's the at sign and their name as it appears on LinkedIn. Hashtags, I think you all know what they are. And the idea is to use hashtags that LinkedIn will auto-populate. So if you start type, typing in, I'll use one that uh, I use today, job, and then I put the S in and it offers job search, job search tips, job search advice. Use the ones that make sense for what this comment would be, what this article would be. Now, I'm going to go back to dating here for a second. When you when you decided you wanted to go dating, did you give up after one or two bad experiences? No. You were persistent. You kept working the system. You tried. You know, maybe you, you told more people that you were uh, interested in going out. Whatever it is, you didn't quit. You were persistent. And thus... My reminder is always about look for situations to show initiative and leadership. These get you noticed internally and eventually will get you, you noticed externally too. True? Am I saying anything that, that's incorrect so far? If you disagree, my feelings aren't hurt. I got a thumbs up from David. Good. Thank you very much. John as well. Good. Good. You have David's name up, uh, and I don't know your name. I apologize. I'm Alan. Alan, nice to meet you, and, and thank you for the thumbs up. It's all like the world of dating and how you do things to be desirable to others because you want to give them a feeling. And part of giving someone a feeling, thank you. Uh, I'm seeing a thumbs up from uh, if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. Pollock Pro Project. Thank you. You want to give people the feeling, not just the fact. Lots of people can recite facts. But being expressive with your emotions and risking being rejected, heck, in the situation where you're being well behaved, you're getting rejected now. <laughs> And I'll remind you that at least if you're hired and you put your your real self out there in all its glory and you're rejected, that's fair. I don't really like it. He's so expressive or it's really analytical. I like the analytical. Whatever it is, it's your best version of yourself and being the most and being world class at it. So I grew up in a generational. I'm sorry. Did I hear someone speak? I apologize, John. Yeah, yeah I, just another venue for all of this is uh, your experience as a, a user of one, two, three types of software. The vendors in particular are always looking for positive comments. So you can leverage yourself that way, and it's really quite easy to uh, get yourself in front of an audience at vendor conferences, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Putting yourself out there, going to market. I'll speak as the divorced guy, because I've been a divorced guy <laughs> as well. <laughs> Eventually, a friend drags you out to go somewhere with him, and you function as a bad wingman. And he's having a good time. I felt miserable. And eventually I got better at it. The idea is you're going to make mistakes. Don't go back into the cocoon. The cocoon isn't safe. There is no safety. Even when you're modest or unexpressive, that's not a safe place to be. Internally, when they're making cut decisions, if you're like everyone else, you're like everyone else. It doesn't really matter. How can you become more visible in your organization and better connected so that in this way, it's painful for them to consider cutting you, right? 
Um, I want to be respectful of time. David, I tend to go to about 11 o'clock. Is that okay? Jeff, you're doing fine for time. 11 o'clock or plus or minus is great. Super. Thank you. Just want to make sure. So my reminders, be visible. Show initiative and leadership. Get yourself noticed internally. That eventually leads you to be noticed externally too. Stay in touch with the people you speak to, date, go out with, <laughs> because they can lead you to other situations. Use photos and video more on LinkedIn to share your ideas and opinions. Grabbing one of these and just recording a quick video, a minute tops. Uploading it to LinkedIn will serve you. Comment about other, what other people posts. Keep going to places where you'll meet people. <laughs> Just like in dating, you practice in safe spots that allow you to, again, be more visible. Now, this one, you know, it's... It's a hard one for some people to hear. Um, carry yourself like a success. Act like a winner. Stop being so friggin' tentative. Be great. You know, I close all my, my uh, interviews now, my, my videos and podcasts by saying be great. Because generationally, I grew up at a time where people said, take it easy. Why should I take it easy? <laughs> <laughs> I want to I want to help people be great. So act like you want to be seen as excellent and excellent to an even bigger universe. Show up. Perform consistently. Take ownership and meet deadlines. Make sure people know that what what you did online and in person talk with them about the work that you do and some of the things that you are successful about tell the story of your successes in articles that you write on linkedin and if you have a blog you can write it on a blog as well the idea is to build your reputation as someone reliable trustworthy accountable who delivers results and people know about it because you can do great work like the tree that falls in the woods and no one hears about it <laughs> and that's the way you are then you're not making a sound because no one's hearing this your goal is to establish a strong professional reputation and increase your potential value to employers, not just simply in your current one, but to those outside your organization as well, so that they can find you, so they can figure out, hey, she can do a great job for me doing that. She, she did that for them? Maybe I should talk with her. Or he did this? Wow, um, that's interesting. I'd like to talk with them become known as the expert. And I'm going to repeat something I was just talking about a moment ago. Do everything you do world class, not half-assed. <laughs> be great, not doing good enough work. Because you want to be known as someone who people come to, right? And thus, instead of being ordinary, being exceptional and people knowing about it. That's part of the risk that some of you need to learn to take. I remember uh, a client of mine said something that they were, they thought was cutting when they said, oh, you really know how to promote yourself. And I said, thank you. <laughs> and they were kind of surprised. And I took it as an incredible compliment. I was filling a ton of positions for them and they would see um, my letterhead, Jeff Alpin, the big game hunter, and you know things I had written because I was forwarded to them from time to time. And then I just got into video and podcasting 
And, you know, my book of business grew tremendously. But they thought they were being insulting by saying, you really promote yourself a lot. Yes, thank you. You've noticed I accomplished my point. Remember, the people who aren't going to like you because you put yourself out there aren't the ones that would ever help you anyway. I'll close just with a quick story about someone I knew, um, again, from a, a group uh, I worked with for a long time. Uh, and uh, basically, I, I was working with people uh, in a couple of areas of the country about helping them with integrity, accountability, authenticity, and a few other things. Great human qualities. And this guy comes to me and said, and says, why can't you be more like one of the guys? Why can't you be more like them? And I said, why do you want me to be different? <laughs> why should I be different? And that's really the issue for many of you. You're not different enough. My encouragement to you is figure out what makes you special. What makes you different from others? And use that to your advantage because the right organization and the right people will love it. And like this dating situation, the wrong ones, you're not going to want to go out with anyway. It becomes a way that you can screen people out by having them screen you out. And that's a good thing. So as Carol just put up, being different is better than better. It's so true. So thank you for the opportunity to present. And if you have any questions, comments, even if you disagree with me, my feelings aren't going to be hurt. It will help others in the room. Jeff, I have one comment. And now um, sure. I'm being visible because I'm Alan instead of David. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember you, Alan. I used to get your resume. <laughs> Please continue. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. My comment is uh, LinkedIn recommendations are great, too, because that gives you credibility from another source as well. Too. Right. Anytime you've done something for someone else, ask them if they'll give you a recommendation. And you can say, I can draft something for you. When you have 100 recommendations, it's much better than if you have four. Four, especially for those of us I'm seeing here, don't doesn't really distinguish you. Why wouldn't someone recommend you if you've been out in the bit out professionally for 20, 30, 40 years? Ask for recommendations. Endorsements are a distinct second choice. But you can craft a recommendation for someone. Yeah, good comment. Yeah, thank you very much. Anybody else um, online or here in person have a question for Jeff? We have an opportunity to speak with someone who is great himself in uh, helping all of us. Going once, going twice. And thus, I'm going to ask all of you, what's one useful thing that you have taken from this conversation? And how do you expect, how do you want to apply this, anything that you've heard going forward? One thing. Okay. Hi, Jeff. I'm Alexandra. Hi. Um, so what I did take, and maybe that's why I came here, is uh, we need to put ourselves out there. So here I am. And I want to thank you for today. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Who else? One thing. I just want to hear one thing that you heard today that was useful that you might try applying going forward. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. It's Patty Sheffer. I have to say being yourself is really, really good because I think you're, you're afraid to be yourself because you want to fit in. But I think being um, different really does put you ahead of the game. And it and if it's if it's not a good fit, it's not a good fit. And you know that right away. So I thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. Who else? This is Melissa. I um, 
my camera is a little, I don't understand the system yet, but um, to network sometimes, and I, I have no problem putting my, I was, I'm a former journalist, so I have no problem asking questions or telling stories, but when is it too much? When, uh, that's, a, that's an easy one for me to answer. Uh, when you notice them not paying attention. Because and sometimes I know you know they, how to notice. <laughs> yeah, sometimes if they walk away and say, well, wow, I mean, there's no way I can, you know, for instance, I discovered Judge Judy and put her on the air and she got a show after that. And, you know, I tell stories, I might tell a story or two like that. And, you know, then people will feel like, I don't know what else I can say to this person. I get that feeling. Right. And the idea sometimes maybe to adapt your story, tell a different story, because you have to pay attention to the audience. Your job professionally is not just to bask in your own magnificence. It's about connection. What yeah, story? Well, it's not can... really basking. It's more getting their attention or just like you said before, standing out mm -hmm. um, in some way or telling a story that's a little off the beaten path. And um so, so, you know, as a journalist, we don't really bask. I'm not, I wasn't on the air. I was an investigative person. So, mm -hmm. so we try to stay in the background. That's where my, that's where I'm most comfortable. But I might say and, something like that to get attention. And if you think back to my ele elevator pitch, people hire you to do what? Because you notice all the details that go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. They hire you because they feel comfortable with you. Yes. But, a lot of, but there are a lot of people that individuals feel comfortable with. What's unique about you? That you have the skills to do the job. That's not unique, especially in New York. Okay. What Think is about unique? it like them as to what would grab them. What, what would be the hook that, that makes you unique? And I think the idea of you hear the things and notice the things that often go unnoticed that allow you to write a great story or provide information to people, whatever it is. So Jeff, it sounds like you're, you're saying maybe the soft skills are the things that may separate us from the hard skills that everybody has for the job. If they're interviewing someone, they're not interviewing one person, they're interviewing multiples. And they've read in the resume, as Ed Hahn pointed out, the resume gets people in the door. But after that, you got to deliver what makes you different, that connects with them. And the focus has to be on connecting with the audience. And if the story doesn't connect with the audience, it's not working. So it may require a different story that they connect to, and this becomes a secondary story. Stories that relate to what it is that they're looking for make a difference. And David, thank you for putting that up. Uh, he's a recruiter and he's seen tons of resumes and interviewed many, many people. Uh, so your goal is to get asked out on a date. And then from them, from there, make them fall in love so that you can make a choice as to what serves you. Because I'm not telling you that what you should do is accept any job that's offered to you but I want you to accept the right one. Right. And the goal has to be connecting with people so that they fall in love. Hey, good to see you on camera. Yes, I wanted to thank you, Jeff, um, if I may. Um, uh, what I'm taking away is not to be become discouraged and to um, not give up. Persistence is so important. And just remember, when you go out with the wrong person, you know, you don't want to be involved with them. You want to find the right person, the right organization. It's important to be flexible within that is I know with my wife, she wasn't the person I met wasn't the one I, I thought I would fall in love with. And I did. Yes. You learn from that and say what you don't like. Uh, so same thing in that job, you learn yeah. what you didn't like about the employer or the, the the team or whatever, and then you know what not to look for or what what to look for in the future. Absolutely, nice to meet you. Hope to see you again on one of these. Yeah.
And I hope your job search doesn't go on for too long. Thank you. Anyone else? Folks, any, anyone else have a question for Jeff while we're still together? Anyone else have something that they took from this that they'd like to share? I heard a hi, Jeff, and I'm not seeing or hearing anything more. Sorry, I couldn't tell if you could hear me or not. I, I'm Jacqueline. I, I have a question for you in terms of differentiating. And, and I also you could start out saying thank you so much for the presentation. So um, I, in, in addition to my like real career, I've um, also got involved with local politics. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, if I share that, say, like on LinkedIn, um, in terms of some of the things I'm doing in my local um, district or town, if, if that's something that would um, kind of create a real differentiator in terms of, you know, the kind of corporate experience. With some firms, it'll be a positive and with others, it'll be a negative. You know that already. Right. And the question is, do you care about the ones who won't like it? Now, for the, if you're out of work and you need to land someone fast, something fast, it may not be the best thing for you to do. And for the right organization, they're going to like that quality in you. Okay. Assuming we're not talking about you're a member of the local Antifa chapter or the MAGA. You know, I'm trying to deal with the two extremes here. Uh, so as long as you're not presenting as being uh, an extreme in one direction or another, which in local politics you really wouldn't be. But think about it from their standpoint. What would they want to know about you from the political side? Uh, okay. And does that help? Yeah, it, it makes sense. It's, it's, it's a thing that I, I go back and forth on in terms of whether I come out, so to speak, or, or not. And... To me, at this stage in my life, I'm out there with whatever it is I do. Uh, so for me, I'm fearless about this kind of stuff because I've learned that for me, I really don't care about the, the ones who judge me. I want to be associated with people who will get to know, like, trust, and respect me for who I am in my totality. So... I've got a number of books out on job search, but I also have cookbooks and game books out too, all for Kindle. And I do it because it's fun for me and it helps people. Someone even rented my book about making dog treats. <laughs> Is that part of my normal branding? No, but it's fun for me. I enjoy it. It helps me be bigger in the world. You've got your version of it. Be great. Don't be inhibited. You know, you know, Jeff, what it sounds like is you can also do this in a bit of a targeted fashion. Some of us may think I'll put together the perfect resume that has everything about me that I think is important. But maybe each company being a little different should have their own version of your resume. Of course. And, and the notion of tailoring resumes to positions and job uh, to and organizations, um, I've forgotten that I should actually mention that. But always think like the audience. What do they want to know about you? You know, when I, I've been to this group and other groups and done my interview framework presentation, I start off by confirming what the job is. And then in response to the question, tell me about yourself. I try to help someone connect with the interviewer quickly that you can do the job. And the way I do it is in the typical interview answer to tell me about yourself, I'll say, take 20, 25 seconds to answer in the typical way. I've been in the field now for however long it's been. For the last few years, I've been working for so-and-so where I've done this and that, this and that. And before that, I did such and such for so-and-so. And about 20, 25 seconds in, I'll tell people, and then you use a bridge phrase. But what's probably most relevant in my background for this role is my experience with. 
and they know immediately and their ears perk up. They know the next thing you're going to say is important and they listen because what you're doing is telling them how what you've done in your past connects with what they need you to do. Always think like the audience. What do they care about? What matters to them? Yeah, I think I think I have a good story for that, and then I, I I'm looking at a, a comment from someone who's basically saying, which is true, if anyone's looking at me for anything, they're going to Google me, and they're going to see that I'm that I'm currently already in office. So uh-huh. it's like, it's not like I can hide this from anybody. Ah, so okay. Put it out. You know? Excellent, excellent. So they Google, and they'll find you. And firms do Google. I have a yeah. comment. If you, if this is Charlie R. Uh, I'm trying to off. Um, if you present your political stuff as something you did to solve problems, to communicate, to do other virtuous things that you would also do inside the company, it's all a plus as long as you stay away from having the ax to grind politically. You know, all these things that you are doing are what we refer to as transferable skills. If you could present some of your political activities in that manner, it just reinforces your broad brand of problem solving, making changes. Yeah, actually affordable housing, you know, supporting diversity, uh, I, I think it's all good stuff. I mean, there's nothing really controversial about it right now. Um, Other hood and apple pie. Yeah. <laughs> and Jacqueline, th- think in terms of how it represents leadership in your life. That's another point too. Because uh, yeah. I my on my first election, I had the most vo- uh, votes of anyone. You know, beating incumbents. Uh, so it's a good story. I just need to figure out how to support that Mm -hmm. always where you are talking about being a leader in life and that it's part of who you are connected with the stories that you tell and the position that they're trying to fill like there's someone i I helped fill a job with Um, she was uh, an associate press secretary on the obama campaign And she was hired for a not-for-profit in New York after six interviews. Because although the role was different than what she had done for Senator Obama uh, on his first campaign, they saw something about her that clicked. As I said before, the right organization is going to get you. The wrong organization is going to try and change you. Right. You want to find the right organization and by being full and rich and magnificent and great by doing things world class as opposed to being inhibited. It's a harder road. No question about that. But it's truly the better road. Great. Thank thank you, everyone. Um, You know, Jeff and and everyone on the uh, call who gave me the comments. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And as Tracy put into chat, be great, world class. Okay. Well, thank you, Jeff, very much for first of all giving this presentation. <laughs> very good. And but also for continuing to be a, a supporter of job search, people in job search, and our group as well. So we're very appreciative. We've gotten to know you and. Uh, you continue to come hang out with us uh, as well. So thank you very much. Um, I, I really liked, um, uh, you know, what makes you different. And what began to think about, I began to think about was, maybe I need a little bit of time to think about this. It may not be a question that you can just spurt off the cuff. Maybe for some of you it can. So, you know, what we kind of say in the job search world, do a self-assessment, kind of figure out, deep dive, maybe sit down with a cup of coffee or tea, uh, hopefully not something too strongly alcoholic, um, but uh, to, uh, may, maybe even make a list, take a piece of paper, pros and cons, whatever works for you, and pick out from that those qualities or traits or work habits or whatever it is 
that you'll really be able to answer that question off the cuff. So it's, we call it a self-assessment, kind of think about it. And um, uh, also, um, you know, meeting people or, or dating, it's not about who you know. It's about who knows you. And so, you know, Jeff talked about staying in touch with these people. So if you think about that first date and that didn't go well and you're not in touch with that person, you could say, well, I know so-and-so, but so-and-so is probably not thinking about you anymore. So it's really about who thinks about you, who knows you, who you've developed those uh, professional relationships with. And uh, as for, you know, Jeff says, be great. Uh, you know, we've talked a number of times and when we wrap up a call, that's what he says. He doesn't say goodbye. He says, be great. And I'm sure we'll see him again in just a couple of minutes. So it's kind of uh, a mindset that's really very optimistic and terrific. Go out there and be the best you can be. So uh, appreciate the positive attitude, sir. Thank you. So um, thank you, uh, everyone. Want to let just let, let you know what's coming up over the next couple of weeks. We will be right back here next week. Coach Paul Sakala, career coach Paul Sakala will be here. A practical work search methodology. And Jeff is applauding Paul, so thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, a practical work search methodology. So that's what Paul will be talking about. Uh, I believe he's going to be here in person. So for those of you who are on the fence about coming or not, uh, Jeff said, well, he's on the fence, but he's leaning towards being here. If you want to talk with him in person after the meeting, you'll have that opportunity to do so. And that's the 17th. And the following week, the 24th, Lapora Lindsay will be here. The advantages of rejection. So, uh, you know, some people say, you know, each no is one step closer to a yes. I guess that's a little part of it. But what you can learn <clears throat> and take away from uh, the fact that you did not get that recent uh, posting. So the advantages of rejection. Tomorrow morning, the Breakfast Club of New Jersey will be meeting, thebreakfastclubnj.com. They meet at 8 o'clock in the morning. And uh, someone that Jeff has heard of, Ed Hahn, <laughs> will be presenting. So uh, he'll be presenting your job search in you in 2023. And Ed is a corporate recruiter. He's also been an agency recruiter, has a lot of information about job search. He's just a big helper for people in transition. Also, um, New Jersey Job Seekers meets uh, every other Tuesday, second and fourth Tuesday of the month, uh, um, 7.30 in the evening. I did post the connection information in our LinkedIn group. There's a long link, so I'm not gonna read it right now. And of course, visit our cousin organizations, PSG of Central New Jersey on Monday mornings, psgcnj.biz, and PSG of, Mercer, of Morris County, PSG of Morris County, psgmc.org, Wednesday mornings. So that's what's coming up over the next week or two. So once again, thank you very much to Jeff. Thank you for everyone here who is participating. Um, and until we get to see you uh, hopefully live, but if not virtually, we'll simply say, hi, everybody. <laughs>